I used to be a postdoc here at KUMC, so this is very, very familiar to me. Uh, I have been in these seats sitting where you guys have been attending professional talks, so this feels like uh, a homecoming to me. So thank you all for having me. Um, in, I'm just going to jump into my talk and you'll see where my journey has been as, as I go along instead of me telling you about it up front. Um, can I can I walk and talk? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is, can anyone can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Right in the back. Okay. <laughs> so in 2014, I stood in front of um, a classroom of high school students talking to them about this wondrous thing in our head that we call the brain. There was a girl that was sitting right at the back wearing a black beanie hat sitting over there. Um, slumped on the table. I didn't think she was listening to me. But as I started talking and um, went, went into the details about action potentials and neurotransmitters and the neurobiology of addiction and all that fun stuff, I saw her visibly perking up. Um, and eventually she raised her hand and she started asking questions. After my lecture was done, uh, the high school teacher took me aside and said that was the most engaged beanie girl I've been um, in any of the classes, which, which to me was the nicest thing anyone had ever said to me to <laughs> about my teaching abilities at least. Um, so that was nice. Um, and I didn't, I didn't realize it at that time, but that was my first stint in science communication. Um, I loved it. I was a third year graduate student pursuing my PhD. Um, I loved it and I kept coming back for more because um, as shallow as it sounds, it might just be instant gratification. Um, as scientists, we perform experiments and design hypotheses and wait for the results and it takes months and years to get publications out and it's a, it's a slow process. So there's a lot of delayed gratification that goes on in science. Um, but when, you, when you're talking to someone and um, you connect with them and you see that little light bulb go in, go in their head when they just like get you, uh, that sort of in, instant gratification to me was very, very special. And that is what kept me coming back to um, communicating science or doing science communication. Um, and I've said science communication 37 times since I started, but I haven't told you what it is. So um, in, in a broad sense, um, science communication is essentially a person transmitting science-related information to another person. Um, so we can do this in the form of journal articles, scientific seminars, grant applications, all of this fun stuff that we do in academia. But um, more and more science communication, or SciCom, as the cool folks on social media call it, uh, is meaning uh, communication of science-related information to a non-scientific audience. Um, and that's what I will basically be talking about today. Um, so my journey into science communication was more like a stumble. I just stumbled into it. I happened upon it. Um, and I'm hoping that today I can maybe uh, give you some tips that can make you a little more intentional about your science communication efforts. Um, and uh, hopefully you will um, pursue it later on. So why, um, why is it important? Why should we communicate our science? Um, I see three main reasons why we should be uh, communicating science to um, a non-scientific audience. Uh, it is to inform people, to influence people's behaviors or um, attitudes, and to inspire them. So in the US, Eight in 10 or 80% of internet users look up health-related information online. But of these 80%, a third of them don't really have uh, the health literacy to understand what they are reading. They probably don't fully understand that health-related information to make decisions about uh, their health care. So that is where people like you and me come in. That is where we scientists come in. We are responsible for communicating um, our work and health-related information that is out there to 
patients and to individuals and families who are interested in a way that is easily accessible to them. And then um, I'm sure you all have, I see someone in your social media posts, uh, social media feeds, who post stuff like this, where if you drink this detox juice, you are never ever going to get cancer. Um, <laughs> that is something <laughs> that bothers me that I, I'm sure it does bother a lot of you as well. Um, and that is where we should be working to influence people's uh, behaviors and actions and attitudes um, about the sort of information that they see and make them realize that they should probably be questioning it a little uh, deeper and questioning the kind of sources that they're getting this information from uh, before they make these choices to shun conventional therapy and um, just go with detox uh, juices or what have you. Um, so why would anyone listen to us? It, given the socio-political climate of this country right now, um, it seems like scientists are under attack. Um, why would anyone listen to us? That's good news. Um, contrary to what we think right now, there was a study done by uh, the Pew Research Center, which surveyed about 4,000 Americans and asked them about their attitudes towards scientists and science in general. Um, and 61% of those said that they do trust scientists. Yay for us. Uh, you're just after the military, so I guess that's good news. Um, so yeah, so um, I, I think we have uh, the ability to influence people. People are ready to listen to us. And we know how public perception can uh, shape science policy. So use all of this goodwill to cash in on that research funding. Talk to your um, local representatives, elected officials. Tell them why the science you do is important. And tell it to them in a way that they understand and that they understand the importance of it. Um, and then the last reason why I think um, we should communicate science is to inspire the next generation, um, to inspire other younger children to uh, pursue a career in science or in STEM, um, to, sh to show them that they have role models that they can aspire to be uh, when they grow up. And I think that kind of communication is a little hard because how do you hold the attention of a little kid and tell them all of this complex information without them actually having a knowledge base of it? So inform, influence, and inspire for me is kind of like a um, uphill battle in terms of uh, the level of difficulty uh, if, when, you're, when you're communicating science. But there's ways we can do that. Oops, not like that. Um, so I'm going to discuss two main communication, science, uh, communication strategies today. The first is to tell a story. We all love a good story. As humans, we are wired to listen to stories, to react emotionally, to be vested emotionally in someone who tells us a good story. Um, and by, when I say tell them a story, I, I don't mean make up facts. Um, I mean present the facts in a way that relates to um, another person who doesn't have the same background as you do. So in academia, this is usually how we present um, information. We start very broad, up at the top, we have all of our background information. Alzheimer's is bad, that affects so many people, and um, we do not have any treatments. Then we go to the methods. We did this in rats, and we fed them this medicine. And this is how we, how we measured Alzheimer's disease in rats. Um, and then we whittle it down to the results. Uh, this medicine work or do not work, either way, uh, please report it, even if it doesn't work. Um, so we have this inverted pyramid uh, that we follow when we are in academia and we write a uh, research paper. But when we are talking to a lay audience, I don't think that's the best strategy. What we need to do is invert this triangle on its head, start with the most important information on top, so anything that you think is newsworthy, um, that's you know eye-catching, interesting, put that on top. Uh, this and this drugs showed promising results in rats, but as I was saying, you know? um, then lead into the supporting information, um, details that will help people put what you just said into context. Uh, why is this important? Why have there not been treatments so far? Uh, what does this mean for 
the future. What does this mean for actual patients? Um, show them that information. Um, and then in the end, add those details, which would probably be nice for them to know, but they don't really need to know it. They don't need to know why uh, the novel object recognition test in your ads was how it was done and whether it worked or did not work for it. You know, so it's the little details that not that that people other than scientists probably would not care about. So think about this the next time you are talking to someone who does not share the same background as you do. Give them the bottom line first. Okay. Another strategy to tell a story is to use the ABT or the hand but tech work approach. Um, in any good story, in any good movie, there's always this uh, interaction between time and tension that, that's going on uh, as we proceed from the beginning to the end of the story. Um, in the beginning, there's characters, there's settings. You introduce these. Um, everything's going well. The characters are getting along. Uh, but then there's a problem. Uh, that was have a spat. Someone gets murdered. Um, something bad happens. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's your uh, conflict point. That is what makes the story interesting. So then you proceed into the middle. Uh, you show how uh, a murder is getting with what you did, what someone did to resolve the murder or bring the lovers together. Um, so the story proceeds. That's the act two, that's your middle. And then in the end, you find out who, who did the murder, um, how uh, everyone got back together, how everyone's a big happy family now, um, and that's your end. So everything ties up into this nice little neat package. Um, and you can use the same structure to tell people about science. Um, and the way you do this is you use and, but, and therefore. So you have a beginning, middle, and an end. So um, I kind of have an exercise for those of you uh, who are doing research um, to think about your research in this and, but, therefore framework. So um, dash and dash, so fact, observable data, and dash, fact, observable data, but here's the problem, therefore we did this to solve that. So for example, if um, I was to talk about my postdoctoral research, I would tell you that um, old people get brain injuries a lot because they fall down a lot, um, and they do not recover the same way that young people do. But not a lot of studies, uh, not a lot of people study this. Therefore, um, we wanted to know uh, what mechanisms are different between old and young people's brains, uh, so we can develop better treatments for them. Okay. I hope I hope I did a good job at that time. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, I want you all to take a minute and maybe write down uh, about your research uh, in this handbook. Therefore, follow. Or if you've come across an interesting um, feeling, uh, interesting paper in the past few days that you would want to summarize in this way, feel free to do that. Stay there for three minutes. Yeah. And then if anyone wants to volunteer uh, later on, that would be super helpful.
So in the last study, we have seen that people who are suffering from HIV, they are also taking drugs of abuse like cocaine and methamphetamine. And we have also seen that those people who are drug addicts and HIV patients, they also suffer from pulmonary hypertension. But not all of them. Therefore, we want to study that what is the difference between those who get pulmonary hypertension and HIV and drug or substance is present in them, and what is the difference between those who do not get pulmonary That was great. It was very clear what your research problem was and why you were looking at it. Thank you. So we are working on a nuclear receptor which helps to reduce inflammatory responses and we found that when this receptor is overexpressed, uh, there is a less production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, but this works in cell-specific manner, like in macrophage and tissues, we can find different uh, outcome. Therefore, we can, if we can target this nuclear receptor in a cell-specific manner, we can cure the problem of abnormal inflammatory response. Great. Thank you for sharing. So, um, in the uh, in the two and but therefore stories that were shared so far, um, are there any people who are unfamiliar with certain um, terms or they're all scientists? So I guess we all know about nuclear receptors and inflammation, inflammation and pulmonary hypertension. Um, and it's great that you framed it in that structure, but. Um, I want us to look at another um, another technique where we can make that beautiful message that, that you've come up with even more clear. And the way to do that is by avoiding jargon. So I understood totally what you told me about nuclear receptors and cell-specific uh, information. But if imagine if you were to tell that to uh, your grandmother, um, she would be a little lost, I assume. <laughs> If, assuming she doesn't have a science background, if she's a scientist or like a medicine person, <laughs> um, so the next strategy is after you have made your and but therefore story, to then um, look at your language and alter it in a way that there is no jargon. And I'm not saying that jargon is bad. Uh, there's 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 situations where jargon is is exactly what you need. Um, can, does anyone can anyone think of a situation where we don't need jargon? Yeah. How about a hospital's ER? We have a code blue. We need a CPR team. Push 500 of FE staff. Okay. So jargon is necessary when you want to convey a large amount of information in a really short amount of time. But it's not useful when you're trying to draw someone in uh, to a story that might be complex in the first place. So a scientist communicating with non-scientists, we need to avoid that. Uh, otherwise, they're going to get frustrated like this little old lady over here who asked a scientist for time and he went into this very big ramble about temporal state and uh, I don't know, something else. <laughs> okay, so I have another um, exercise for you. For those of you who are doing research, um, if you can pair up, um, I know this is not like an ideal situation where you pair up with sitting far apart and everything. But if you can find a partner, um, actually, has any of you seen Outlander this week? Yes. Oh, oh, you have, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I, I binge watched like two seasons of it last week. <laughs> so it's about this woman who time travels into the 18th century. So I want to take a page out of that book and um, have one of you in the pair pretend that you are a time traveler from the 18th century who has Landed into our modern world, um, maybe someone 
just after American Independence or something. Um, and the other person has to explain their research to them, may, using Anchor therefore or not, either way. Um, I just want you to explain your research to someone who's come from the 18th century. Um, so if you guys can like maybe work in pairs and do that, and then we, we are going to flip it around and have a similar exercise so that you know you get you both get to experience it. And the 18th century time traveler person can ask questions and make it more interesting. Feel free. <laughs> Everybody pop at the place. <laughs> <laughs> and if not, someone doesn't have a partner, then I'm happy to be your 18th century. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Activated, then it may 
may cause some problem. So if we can control how uh, lactation gonna be, if we can reduce some of the diseases that were experienced. And then we talk a lot about <laughs> because uh, she was curious, she was from 18th century about cell and everything. So basically what I told you that that we can system and control it not to the worry. That was good. So you try to put yourself in her frame of mind and try to imagine what the things that she would know and wouldn't know and try to frame your message accordingly. Um, and that that's that's exactly what science communication is about. You are supposed to put yourself in the other person's um, shoes and try to frame your message accordingly. Um, one way you could probably try to do that is uh, try to think of things that they might know and relate to that. So, uh, for example, if I wanted to tell someone that uh, there's 30 grams of sugar in a 12 ounce soda can, uh, the way I could make it more relatable was by telling them that um, if you put six teaspoons of sugar in your regular coffee cup, that's how much sugar is going to be in that soda. So it makes it a little bit more visual. It builds on frameworks that they already have um, in their minds. So those are some techniques that you can do. Now, we're going to flip it around, and the uh, person who's explaining is going to be the 18th century time traveler now. And uh, the other person is going to explain um, a technique in your lab that you commonly um, use. Could be, I don't know, Western dots, PCR, um, gene editing, whatever. Go. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, where do you start? You, uh, first of all, would pick a field and um, hopefully it would be something that you have uh, some knowledge of and that you are really interested in. Uh, just so that it makes things easier for you because when you know things, you're able to explain them better and find better explanations um, to them. Um, next, identify your audience. Like we just uh, spoke about, like an 18th century time traveler may not know the same things that someone who came 50 years ago uh, would know. Uh, a kid wouldn't know the same thing that uh, maybe a college graduate knows. So identify your audience. Uh, Make sure you have a balance between um, being too broad and too narrow. If you're too broad, um, you can't please everyone. Uh, you can't cater to every audience's um, needs. But again, if you're too narrow, you're going to miss out um, a lot of people. So it's the same problem uh, if you're too broad or too narrow. Um, and then you have to choose a medium. How are you going to do this? How are you going to communicate your science? Um, is it going to be through public speaking? Um, is it going to be through writing? Um, is it going to be through um, visual aids? Are you going to make videos uh, of stuff? Um, and most importantly these days, is it going to be on social media? <laughs> because um, to modify the old saying, um, if a tree falls in a forest and no one hears it, if you do something and don't do it on social media, it didn't happen because so think about it. Um, okay. So in order to start, uh, you need to take stock of your skills and resources and make a list of the skills and resources you have versus those that you need. Um, and ultimately, you want to bridge this gap between the skills that you have uh, or resources that you have and those that you need. Um, so skills could be um, anything from writing, photography, uh, recording videos. And then the resources you need um, are going to be Things like uh, if you're going to be writing a blog, then websites, how to make a website or host it. Um, if you're going to make a podcast, then you probably need um, a lot of audio recording stuff and um, editing all of that audio. And I don't know, a lot of complicated stuff goes into that. I've never made a podcast, but <laughs> if you're into that sort of thing, you need to think about that. Um, so think about your skills. Uh, think about the skills that you already have. Um, so if you, for example, um, want to uh, want to develop a podcast, you know that you're good at writing the script part of it. You know you have that ability to communicate clearly, but you don't know the other technical part of it. So the skills that you have are script writing and the skills or resources that you need are uh, audio editing, for example. Um, and then you want to go about uh, making sure you get opportunities that will help you bridge that distance. Okay. Um, how can you do that? There are some trainings and fellowships uh, that are starting to be available in the field of science communication. But let me start with what you can do here at KUMC. So for me, um, a lot of my science communication was done here. I, um, in, in, um, at Hogland where I work, we used to have high school students come in and we used to give them a tour of our MRI facility, we used to talk to them about the research that we did. So that was um, kind of an extension of a little bit of the science communication that I had done during my PhD. But then I also um, joined this wonderful, wonderful organization called Toastmasters here at UMBC. Please check it out. Dan is here, um, Justine's here. Um, it, the members come from very different backgrounds. They're, they're all uh, employed here at KUMC. And uh, they can be administrative professionals, IT professionals, um, nurses, doctors. They come from very different backgrounds that might not be the same as yours. So please check out this organization. It is an international organization that originally started uh, to help people get over their fear of public speaking and to make them better at public speaking. But now they have a lot more pathways that you can um, uh, what do you say, personalize for your needs. Uh, such as planning or management and leadership management. Uh, so please check out that resource. It's very, very useful. Um, what other things do we have at the UFC? Oh, um, there's a postdoc organization called KC Ribs. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it. Kayla Warburg, I think, is still the president. Um, they organize uh, monthly networking events where someone gets to talk and then you can uh, kind of you know, network with other people who are attending that event. 
that might be a good place for you to uh, start science communication where you can just go out there and talk about the science to a bunch of other people. Um, and then for SciCon fellowships, the internet is your best friend. If you just Google science communication fellowships, you're going to get a huge list. So if that's something that you're interested in, uh, please look that up. There's also a lot of science writing fellowships. Um, the National Association of Science Writers has a lot of um, cool stuff on free resources on their website. They have fellowships. Um, if you've heard of the Scientist magazine, it kind of publishes uh, science in lay, lay terms. They have some fellowships. I think they have a fellowship that offers $50,000 a month. So that might be good. Uh, and most of that work can be done remotely, so you don't physically have to go to that location to pursue that opportunity. Um, and then AAAS, the organization that publishes the science magazine, they have some media and science policy internships or fellowships. So if that's the kind of thing you're interested in, check that out. Um, I do have to mention that most of these opportunities are going to be very, very competitive. Data scientists are being trained to bear rejection. Um, so if that happens to you, there's, it's not the end of the world. There's other things you can do. You can create your own opportunities. Uh, and that's kind of like what I did, not because I got rejected, but because I didn't even look into these things that were already available to me and I just decided to go on my own little path. Uh, but um, what I did was I started with a blog. I didn't actually host it on, I didn't actually have my own website. Uh, I just wanted to focus on the writing part of it, not the web development part of it. So I started with something called medium.com. Um, where you can write, you can read articles, um, but the user interface is so easy. You can just write up a post, post whatever pictures you want, um, making sure that they are Creative Commons licensed, um, and just hit publish. And um, you can share that post with all of your social media channels. Um, so for me, that was a really good starting point. Um, what else? You can create your own, yeah, create your own. If anyone has seen like ASAP, science videos on uh, YouTube and stuff. They, go, they do like really good explainer things. Um, you, if podcasts are the, you know, the, your medium of preference, uh, go for that. There's a lot of um, science communicators on social media. Uh, I am on Instagram and I see a lot of uh, science communicators on Instagram who are, um, sometimes in need of volunteers. So if you don't want to start your own thing right off the bat, you can hit your wagon to one of these people who have already started doing this thing that you might be interested in. Um, and they're always looking for volunteers. So um, if you haven't, please maybe make a social media account and uh, try, to, try to follow those people. Okay, so are there actually any real jobs in this field of science communication that we've been talking about for the past, I don't know, 45 minutes? Um, if you want a job that's actually just science communication, um, it might be a little tricky because there's no one position that describes a science communication job. You might see things like science communication specialist, science communication manager. Sometimes it might not be the same. It might say things like social media manager, uh, public relations, community community engagement manager, public information officer. You just have to go into those uh, uh, post job postings and see what the job description is, what the duties are, and uh, if that's something uh, that speaks to you. I do want to point out that there are some caveats with SciCom uh, as a career. First of all, as I've mentioned, there's maybe Although there are more opportunities now, um, there isn't much training unless you go and get it yourself. Um, again, there's no specific job posts that you can uh, probably, there, there are starting to be, but there's not gonna be one job title that you can look for. Uh, and then because it's kind of a new field, you don't really know what the career trajectory of this is. Um, you don't know how the growth, what the growth is gonna be like. Um, I don't know one person who started doing this about 20 years ago. Uh, she started as a science communicator and now she's a community engagement manager. So she manages other science communicators and helps them strategize um, their outreach efforts. Um, so that's that's what I've heard in terms of growth. But um, if you if you do decide to take up a SciCom job and uh, do it for some, some length of time and decide, hmm, that's not really for me. Or if you just do SciCom on the side, uh, while you're pursuing your graduate school or postdoc, 
you will have developed a bunch of uh, skills that you can transfer to jobs that are available out in the real world. Jobs such as medical writers, medical science liaisons, data application scientists, and this features that I have here. Um, this morning, I actually saw this post, Science Communication Associate Professor. So there's, this was in Mizzou, Columbia. Um, this is actually, you get to teach science communication if you're really good at it, so that's awesome. Um, so yeah, um, I just want to let you know that, um, that science communication is a field where you can marry your hobbies and your interest in science and do that for uh, helping out some people. Um, and that's a pretty decent thing to do. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm here. I'm, I'm now a medical writer. Um, I, um, I'm a freelance medical writer, so it's kind of like working for yourself and choosing the work that you want to do. I have a question. Yes. So, it just, so you said you're a medical writer now. What other kind of stuff have you have you who have you worked for, and kind of what do you you know what's it week kind of look like for you? Um, I have a couple of different clients, and they, um, in terms of jargon writing, yeah. they they range they they cover the whole range. Like I write for a health startup that um, I write blog posts for a health startup that conveys. Um, information about uh, lifestyle choices to their uh, users. Uh, so things like sleep, exercise, health. Um, I'm interested in the brain, so I kind of write those blog posts from the brain perspective of it. Uh, so for that, I have to uh, explain the science in layman's terms. Um, I, who else? I work for uh, a magazine publisher that writes for uh, a clinician audience. So, uh, for them, I can write kind of like how we write for scientists, where you don't really have to tone down the science so much and um, inform them about new diagnostic uh, tools that, that are available. Um, and then the third thing that I do is I work for a medical device company to help them submit uh, safety and performance documents so that they can their, their devices can get approved. Um, and then that's like the highest end of jargon that you can use because uh, Regulatory agencies have these templates and things that um, they want you to follow because they get so many applications and they want to know where to look for some certain things. Uh, yeah, so a typical day, um, it depends, but um, I do tend to write for maybe like eight hours. Uh, all of that, all of that might not be writing. Most of it is research so that I can actually write about things um, and then editing. Did they seek you out or did you seek them out? Um, so for the medical device thing, uh, I it just happened because I happened to know someone. I, I had a friend who knew someone at the company. So yeah. She connected us and I had to give like a small writing test and I cleared that so they hired me. Um, for the oh for the for the uh, blog post for the lay audience, I found them on Twitter. Really? Yeah. She was. Um, um, the director of communications, who's also a recent PhD um, graduate, uh, was advertising for, uh, they were looking for volunteers uh, or volunteer bloggers. And uh, I started off as a volunteer and I keep, kept doing it. Yeah. the blogging thing I was I, I had started doing that uh, before my postdoc had ended so for me that was kind of just like you know continuing it um, for the uh, for the article writing for the clinician audience I had signed up on this platform for free, freelancers uh, it's actually for uh, sci scientists um, you can offer to freelance your scientific services like you can even do experiments for them like that if you want if you want um, it's called Collabtree, K-O-L-A-B, tree.com. Um, and I had my profile up there and um, the, the editor of the magazine reached out to me and uh, I've had an ongoing collaboration with her ever since. How did you decide to just leave and start calling it a full-time writing? <laughs> um, 
it's not that I didn't. So I like, I like, I really like doing research. Um, but I was thinking about whether I uh, saw myself doing it 10 years down the line if I wanted to be a PI. And that, that didn't really feel like something I wanted to do. Um, but I didn't want to be away from science either because I, I like science and I like research. So I was thinking of what qualities um, I can take from my postdoc and use them in a different way or in a slightly different career. And um, I think seems to stick at the top. I did use uh, the tool called My IDP. I don't know if you guys use it. Uh, it's a triple AS tool. Um, when I was a postdoc, I think they were recommending you use it uh, to just like you know, give you a direction and talk to your mentor about things that you want to do and things like that. Uh, so I used it. They, uh, that can actually help you uh, narrow down your top skills, uh, top interests, like what is it that you actually enjoy doing, and then your values. Uh, what are things that are important to you, like autonomy or um, creativity and things like that, helping others. I would recommend using that tool if you feel like you're lost because it does give you a little bit of perspective and then it will uh, show you careers that might use those skills, interest, and in, or that might fit with those skills and interests and you can start to evaluate your choices. Yeah, it is time.